Praise the Lord, everybody. For today's devotional, we're going to discuss etymology. It's okay if you don't know what it is, but we are going to talk about what etymology is, why do etymological type studies, we're going to go through a little demo on how to use it, and then we'll have a personal application of it. So I've only got a couple minutes and a lot to talk about, so let's get started. What is etymology? The definition of etymology, and it's a long one, is the history of a linguistic form, such as a word, shown by tracing its development since its earliest recorded occurrence in the language where it was found, by tracing its transmission from one language to another, by analyzing it to its component parts, by identifying its cognates in other languages, or by tracing it and its cognates to a common ancestral form in an ancestral language. It's a mouthful, but very simply, an etymological type study deals with the origin of a word and its usage throughout history. That's it. Nothing complicated there. But let's see how we could use this in our own biblical study and our own personal devotions. Okay, so for instance, we're studying scripture and we come across Genesis chapter 17. Okay, and it says in verse 1, And when Abram was 90 years old and 9, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God, walk before me, and be thou perfect, and I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. Now, for an etymological type study, this scenario here fits perfectly. Um, we know that in other areas of Scripture, God says in His Word that there is none who does not sin, that uh, all have sin and come short of the glory of God, and that there is none righteous, no, not one. So looking at verse 1 here again, where it says, God was telling Abram to walk before me and be thou perfect, is God being unfair to Abram, knowing that Abram cannot lead a perfect life, knowing that he's human? And hopefully, with an etymological study, we can, under, we can come to understand that that word perfect there at the end of verse 1 does not mean what we think it means today. Okay? So, obviously, you have to get the definition of the word, and let's look at the origin of the word perfect. Okay? Perfect as a word, its first known usage was around the 14th century. Okay? And the definition of perfect in a definition that we use today and that we commonly think of as perfect is being entirely without fault or defect, flawless. However, in the definitions, there is an obsolete definition to the word perfect. And that obsolete definition is mature. Now, it's okay if we don't understand yet what obsolete means, I'm gonna tell you. Webster's standard that they use for determining a definition that is obsolete is that from 1755 onward, if a definition has not been used for a particular word from 1755 onward, they mark that definition as obsolete as though it is no longer used in modern day vernacular. Okay, so that means before 1755, the word perfect in context could have meant mature. Now, now that we got the word perfect down, let's go ahead and look at the Hebrew word that is used in the original text of the Bible for that was translated to perfect. Okay, in Genesis 17, 1 again, we're looking at just the word perfect. That's what etymology is. We're looking at the history and origins of a word. So the word perfect comes from the Hebrew word tamim. Okay, it means complete unscathed or intact. And it comes from a root word in Hebrew, meaning to become completed or finished. So using an entomological type study, we can see here that when God is saying to, to Abram to walk before him and be thou perfect, he's not saying perfect in the sense that we think of is without sin or never fail or never have a bad day. What he is saying is that Abram needs to walk with God so that we, Abram can mature with God and God can finish the work he started in him. 
Okay. And as always, when we talk about an entomologic type study or any study in general of the Bible, we always want to end our study with a personal application. In other words, this knowledge that we just gained, it's good, but if we can't get into our hearts, it's not really going to bear any fruit. Okay. So the personal application that I have found that I've done for myself is this is that God was telling Abram to continue walking with him so he can finish what he started in Abram. It was after this that Abram then received his new name Abraham and was told he would be the father of many nations and given the covenant of circumcision. Okay? So the thing is, is God wanted to give Abram promises and blessings, but could not do so until Abram walked with God and became completed or mature in God. Okay, So the application for us is, what promises and calling has God given us, but that has not come to pass yet? And we, in order to, I guess, help us move along here, we have to be honest with ourselves and say, God, you promised us this, you gave me this calling, why hasn't it happened yet? Maybe God is what not necessarily, God's not necessarily saying that, well, he's going to renege on what he said. We know God doesn't do that. When God makes a promise, it's true. But God's not going to give us that promise or blessing yet until we've matured enough in him to be able to receive the blessing and the ministry that he has for us. And let me give you an example. Me being a father, I'm an imperfect father. Um, a couple years ago, I had bought my son a tank, a painted tank um, that I got from a hobby shop. And I, I got all the parts and I put it together, all the glue, all the stuff that hobbyists would do. It was a lot of work, a lot of hours. And I wanted to have something that I could share with, with my son. Well, I gave that to him, but within a matter of days, he had destroyed it. And the thing that I had wanted to share with him ended up in a trash can. Now that is me as an imperfect father making a mistake. Our Heavenly Father who is perfect will not make that same mistake. That there are blessings and promises and ministries and callings God wants to give each and every one of us. But He's not going to hand it to us until we're mature enough to handle it. Because God's not going to give it to us for us to destroy it or for it to destroy us. So with that, that is how we could use an homology to illuminate scripture for us. How we can take it and apply that scripture to our lives and to our hearts. I hope it's been a blessing to you and I'll see you guys next time.